There's probably 150 players in this space now. So much like Gold Rush, there's a lot of people coming and setting up shop close to the mines. And welcome everyone to another episode of Slater Pod. Today we're really excited to have Phil Hall on the podcast. So Phil's the Chief Growth Officer at LXT, a leader in AI training data based in Ontario, Canada. Hi, Phil, and thanks for joining. Thanks, Florian. It's great to be here. So in what country, what city are you recording this podcast today? I'm actually in Sydney, Australia. So LXT head office is Ontario. Uh, we have people in the US, we have people in the UK, and we have quite a lot of people in Egypt, but um, I'm, I'm in Australia. Um, I, I don't know if you know my background. Tell us a bit more, yeah. I was with an Australian company, Appen, and uh, I was with them from 2001. I was employee number three, and um, I was there for 17 years. Um, when LXT approached me to take on a role with them, I said, look, you know, if I were you, I wouldn't hire somebody that's based in Australia. And they said, oh, trust me, we're okay with this. So, yeah, not for any good reason that I'm in Australia. Except that Sydney is probably one of the best places to live on earth. So why move? Oh, well, it does have that going for it. Absolutely. Great. So yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go anywhere if I wasn't in Sydney uh, either. So uh, <clears throat> first, can you just tell us a bit more about LXT for the listeners of this podcast who tend to be more on the translation, machine translation side of things? Like when was it started by who? And like, what are the key businesses that you're in and some of the people that work for you? Brief history. The company was founded in 2010. Um, it was founded to meet a demand from one of the big tech companies. Um, they came to um, our founder, Muhammad Omar, and said, you know, we need Arabic data and we're having trouble getting Arabic data and it's high quality. And he said, sure, I can do that for you. And uh, he built a really strong relationship with them with year-on-year -year growth throughout the next 10 years where they would just come to him and say, can you do this? And his answer was always yes. And suddenly he went from doing um, Arabic data collection to the point where he was doing 250 languages worth of annotation of, of a wide variety of types plus um, data collection. Um, the company grew out of a head office in Cairo and then established a new head office in um, in Ontario, in uh, Toronto. Um, we currently have around 500 employees. Um, that's about 70 professional staff. And then we have, um, the, the rest are made up of annotators working in secure facilities. Um, we are essentially a services company, but we're a services company with ambitions to be, um, more of a technology company into the future. And so in your uh, current role as chief growth officer, like what does it encompass? Is it sales, marketing, or, or is it also kind of corporate development type of aspects? Yeah, it's, it's all of the above. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the title itself gives you a pretty clear idea of, uh, of what my job is. Um, so. Yeah. When Muhammad approached me to come and join LXT, I had a, I'd, I'd been with Appen for this 17 years, as I mentioned earlier, 10 years as head of sales, and then the next seven years running the primary, um, profit center within the, the company. So, um, and through those 17 years, I'd never gone backwards. We achieved growth every single year. And, uh, mm -hmm. he came and said, well, look, we've got a good, we've got a good business. It's a good operational business, but we don't have a huge customer base and we'd like to achieve some growth. And, uh, Phil, I think you can help us with this. Expand you, you did. So now I think LXT works across, uh, five main use cases like AR, VR, computer vision, conversational AI, search, uh, relevant speech and NLP. Um, so that's quite the journey from the original kind of language centered, um, 
uh, the roots. So what were you, would you say currently are kind of the particular strength and, and what areas do you see are growing the most at the moment? We're still very strong in the speech domain. That That's where the company grew and, um, and the, the demand for speech related work is still very, very high, but we are adding these, these other areas, um, related to, uh, image, video, text, um, search. These are being added very, very rapidly and we're seeing a lot of growth in them. I think that we will continue to see our tick growth for LXT being very focused on more of the language based end of the scale than the image, uh, end of the scale, partly because I think the image and video uh, market is quite crowded. The, the barriers to entry are quite low and therefore, um, a lot of companies that want to be in this space, um, are quite focused on, on this, uh, video and image end of the business. And I think it's probably the, um, so it's probably the most competitive end of the business. It's, um, I don't want to use the term race to the bottom, but they, I've just said it. So it's just kind of a race to the bottom. Um, yeah. Whereas the, the language area is a little more difficult to, uh, to enter the crowd space is a little less crowded and we've got 12 plus years of experience in that area. Is that because the task is a bit more trivial to annotate like images or video? It's just, it's kind of obvious. Well, you know, that's a cat below a bridge. There's certainly that. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say that a lot of the annotation that we do isn't fairly straightforward as well, but, um, in terms of image and video, you can set up one operating center in one part of the world and it's kind of lang language agnostic. So it, you can, you know, once you've got a business set up, that's, that's it. You're, you're in business. Whereas if you're going to, if you're going to provide somebody with a truly global service uh, for language, that takes a bit of time to, to build up. Now, let me ask you a question for sure. We work in a lot of languages. How many do you think is a lot of languages? I think there's kind of concentric circles for, at least in the translation business, like five would be like the core that maybe you expand to like 30. And then it gets really difficult when it exceeds 30 and you get to like a hundred, cause then you need to rely on like a much, much broader, um, kind of network of freelancers or even subcontractors. So I think a hundred would be a lot. Yeah, me too. Um, I mean, I, my experience is very much like yours. I, we do, we do very high volume on five languages. We do significant volume on 30 languages. Um, when I joined LXT, we'd worked in about 250 languages, but, um, in 2022, we worked on 780 languages. That's also a challenge for the backend, for the payment system, for just actually, I mean, knowing even the names of all of these languages, right? That's going very deep into the uh, languages of lesser diffusion, I think, is what uh, what people are referring to it now. Yeah, I mean, I'm, my background is linguistics. Uh, my, before I joined Appen, I was teaching linguistics at a couple of the universities here in Sydney. Um, and I like to think that I know a fair bit about this, but, uh, uh, but I really, the, the languages that we're talking about in this very long tale, um, I have no clue about the names of those languages. But they would be from where mostly Africa or India. There's a pretty big proliferation across, um, South Asia and across Africa. Absolutely. Um, to be honest, I, um, after we got past the 200 plus mark, I stopped looking. So I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly where we're going, but, um, yeah, I, I know that these are, these are languages that have a presence on the internet otherwise you know so it's, it's not it's not simply um you know a lot of my linguist friends do are doing their phds in um languages of the new guinea highlands or um languages about back australia these languages it's a language preservation exercise but um in the case in the case of the work that we're doing it's it's um this is a language preservation element, but they are, they're all languages that have presence on the internet. 
so when you um, label, annotate, do the people that do the labeling and annotation, do they have to be familiar or fluent? Or what's the degree of proficiency in a particular language you, you need to annotate or do the work that you do? Let me be very general here. Generally speaking, um, the default assumption is native speaker. I don't know. We, we don't, I know there are cases, um, there are cases where you can work with non-native speakers and be more cost effective. So, um, if you, if you think about, uh, varieties of English, varieties of Spanish, varieties of Arabic, for example, um, if you think the work can be, um, can be carried out by someone who is a native speaker of any variety of those languages, then you can save money. Um, you know, so Egyptian people whose native language is Egyptian Arabic, uh, come at lower costs than, um, than Saudi Arabic or, um, UAE Arab, for example. So you can, you can save money there, but. That's usually a choice by our clients, not, not a choice by us. Uh, so for us, native speaker is the default assumption. Understand. Just one more aspect of the business, search relevance, which I think uh, some of the others, like uh, I remember Lionbridge doing a lot of this back in the day. Can you just tell us what, what, this, what this is exactly? What does it encompass that, that service? Yeah, search relevance. It can be, um, it can be user intent analysis. So you, you're given search queries. Um, this is what it says. Now, what did the user mean when they wrote that? Okay. So that's, that's a classic form of that. It could be search relevance ranking. So you have a search term, um, search phrase, whatever, and you look at the results that come up and you can mark on the mark off those and say, okay, this one should be at the top of the list. This is a good result. This is a spurious result. It's not what the user meant. And by having that relevance ranking, you can then uh, retrain machine learning and, um, and get more relevant results. And um, I, 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 you, you said that uh, Lionbridge was looking at this a while ago. I'm, I'm sure they're still looking at it today or that TELUS AI is looking at it today because um, it's the kind of thing where there's the need for data in terms of improving the algorithms is ongoing and you ha you can't just hang on to user data forever. You, you have a, it has a use by date on it and it wants to be fresh in order to be effective. So, um, so even though the volumes of data they get annotated are quite large, um, they also get flushed and, uh, and, and recharged. So it's, uh, it's quite an ongoing business. That's a good point. Also on, on the, obviously uh, the language side of things, speech, like is, is there an element of retraining or labeling kind of connected to current events and just emerging concepts? Like for example, COVID, like there's a whole bunch of vocab that just emerged when this, when this, when this hit. Sure. I mean, for, for people who are working in some areas of business, um, so I mean, if you're interested in the entertainment business, um, there's new, new vocabulary emerging daily. So new, new artists, uh, actors, performers, films. Um, so there's content related to that. It's, it's new all the time. Um, emerging geopolitical events. So, um, so you, you do need to keep retuning for that. Do you do any work related to translation or machine translation, or is that something kind of a, quite a niche area of the business? I think it's fair to say that work that we do is feeding into machine translation applications, but, um, we're not, uh, we're not experts in uh, translation and localization per se. And that, um, and, and we're unlikely to become that it's, it's such a, uh, specialized business. Um, we would be starting not just years, but probably decades behind the people who are the leaders in this field. And, um, and so I, I don't think it's a, it would be a smart move for us to, to really refocus on, on that area. But having said that, um, over the years, there have been many occasions when a client has come to, to me, either in my role at LXT or prior to that in my role at Appen, where they want an entire package where 
there's elements of speech, there's elements of text, there's elements of translation, um, and they don't want to source it from multiple vendors. And so we would quite happily carry out translation work in that context. But we don't see ourselves as, as leaders um, when there's some terrific technology, as you'd know, underlying um, modern translation work. And, um, and yeah, we, we, we would never catch up. I also want to talk about a survey you did about a year ago. Uh, you call it the path to AI majority, and you surveyed 200 senior execs uh, in kind of mid to large U.S. organizations. So sh can you tell us what were some of the key findings and what were some of the findings that maybe most surprised you? This is a, a self-assessment. So the, these, executives, um, these executives are rating their own organization or the, their own perception of things, but we... We went to a lot of trouble to ensure that we got the right audience. So 200 executives, but those 200 executives had to go through some pretty extensive screening to take part, um, including screening to actually check that they really did understand about AI and not just feel that they did. Um, and the rejection rate was high. So. I think we rejected 800 and, uh, and kept 200 people who, you know, the, there were 800 people who thought they knew about AI, but failed the, um, failed the screening tests to, to get in. But even, yeah. even so it's about, uh, about self-perception. One of the things that was surprising was that less than 40% were at the higher levels of maturity. Um, so I, th and, and then once we'd made that that split between um, who's at more advanced stages of AI maturity and who's at the experimenting stages, it was interesting. Some of the most interesting results were comparing the perceptions of those who've crossed that line into maturity with those who are at, well, I think we, in the, in the document, we call them experimenters, but I prefer to think of it as at the aspirational stage and at when we looked at that comparison between those two groups, one of the things that um, really surprised me uh, was that um, the aspirational group was under the impression that they're going to do a lot with unannotated data. They, you know, they're just going to get their hands on tons and tons of unannotated data and they're going to throw it in and it's going to do great things. They're going to do lots of unsupervised learning. Whereas the mature group said, uh, no, 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 we, we need lots of annotation and, uh, supervised or semi-supervised learning. Um, so that, that was one of the, the big contrasts was that, yeah. Uh, and, and obviously the, the unsupervised learning unannotated data end of things is the, uh, least expensive way to get into this business and the folks who haven't done it yet, but are pretty sure they're going to do it. They, they were all sure that they were going to do it without spending too much money. And, uh, folks who've already done it were saying, yeah, not so much. So that, that was, but they were among the, um, the interesting findings. Yeah. Maybe a little bit burned by, uh, trying to do it on the cheap. I understand. Uh, what, what, for me, what's, um, was interesting that the financial industry apparently is among the kind of trailblazers in AI adoption. Like, why do you think that is to me, it would seem like a more conservative industry. When we got the results back, we scratched our heads a little bit and thought, oh, what is going on here? Um, but I think it's probably driven by, um, two things. One is that, um, fraud detection, uh, is a natural, um, fit for financials. Um, and it's, it's highly important, increasingly important. So they've got a very strong motivator to be in this space. Um, yeah, and there's, there's a lot for them to gain. And then another thing that I think, um, has led to this is that they have a lot on a lot of the data that you'd be using in the financial sense, uh, doesn't need annotation. So yeah, I, I mentioned, you know, supervised versus unsupervised annotated versus unannotated. Another big distinction is structured versus unstructured. So when you're dealing with lots of speech data, it's unstructured. And if it's unstructured, you can't do a lot until it's been annotated. 
Whereas financial data is inherently highly structured. There's a lot of metadata that comes with it. And that would lend itself to, um, applying machine learning with a much lower threshold of pain, a much lower barrier to entry. And so in the end, I think that they're incentivized because machine learning can do a lot for the financial sector and they have opportunity that other sectors perhaps don't have because of the highly structured data that they work with. That, that's my hypothesis. I, I couldn't tell you it's, uh, whether that's fact or not, but that's, that's what I believe. If you don't know it, nobody would. So I think this is the best assessment we can get. Uh, cause I, in my previous career with that, with the translation company, we were very focused on finance and interesting that they would be, uh, early in this again, because we saw them as super risk averse and all kinds of other aspects, right. For the translation business, we would have to staff people on site. They wouldn't even send us files and, and things like that. Yeah. I had similar experiences. In terms of kind of general adoption, like uh, into the enterprise, like are we seeing roles like chief AI officer or what have you like emerge and like who in the organization would be kind of in charge of budgeting and then deploying AI? Like how does, how is this getting uh, deployed? When I saw your notes, um, I, I looked up to see if I knew any chief AI officers um, and I, I don't personally. Um, but I, I do see the title emerging. I think that it's probably, I've seen, what I have seen is a proliferation of chief information officer roles, chief data officer roles, and head of machine learning roles. And I think they're the people that are, um, that are driving this and, um, you know, run, running what's going on in this area. Um, but chief AI officer may become a very big thing in the future. I think it's the kind of thing that could change very, very quickly. I think it, it will change quickly because, and I was going to talk to you about ChatGPT. I mean, I've never seen so much buzz on Twitter, on the internet, on, on everything. And it's going like very deep into the mainstream now. I mean, it used to be like when we started with Slater, like AI was this like very obscure thing that has had some kind of impact on maybe translation. And now it's like in the broadest, almost the broadest of possible, uh, um, kind of public awareness uh, uh, generally. So I think it's a bit of a watershed moment. So maybe if, if we're not seeing it now, maybe we'll see it in like a year from now. Um, yeah, what, how, what are your thoughts on ChatGPT and the whole kind of buzz around it and Microsoft, uh, you know, OpenAI and Google trying to catch up and all of these things? I did ask myself that same question. Is this, um, is this just um, yeah, a bit of showbiz or, or is it meaningful? Um, I don't I, I, reached the conclusion fairly quickly that it really is meaningful. Um, I think it's quite transformative. Um, at least in my superficial understanding, the gap between, um, chat GPT today and GPT three, which I think was the predecessor, um, is a big gap. So they've made some rapid progress. Microsoft's intention to use this to have to, to change the face of search is, um, is very, very compelling. Uh, I don't know how much, I don't know how much further it's going to need to go to get there, but, um, if anybody can make it happen in terms of resources, um, I would say Microsoft, the Microsoft partnership with open AI is, um, is well enough funded to make it work. And I think. If you're in any doubt as to whether this is uh, showbiz or not, Google's reaction, in at least as it's been reported in the last few days, uh, indicates that they do not think it's um, something to be taken lightly. Yeah, and I mean, what I'm reading as well is that Google could have deployed this or something similar that they were just more cautious, right? I mean, they have Palm, that, that huge language model, and they, they were a bit more afraid of like launching it for probably, uh, yeah, that the blowback, if it didn't turn, if it didn't respond as people were expecting would have been quite fierce. And for open AI, it might've been a little easier as a startup, right? To take some of that, that heat. Yeah. Although I mean, the, the, it does seem that they have one of the, the biggest differences between the GPT-3 and chat GPT is that it's, um, is the way that it responds to hate and, uh, the unpleasant side of uncontrolled, uh, AI. 
it shuts it down, right? It says, I'm, <laughs> I'm not at liberty to, uh, to, to tell you more about this or like, I won't respond to that. Yeah. Uh, what I found fascinating, also speaking like uh, with you uh, from the data annotation side, is like when, when like some of these major tech blogs would write articles like, "Oh, there's like humans doing the annotation behind ChatGPT. It's not all like magic AI." Like when they find out that there's actually you know an army of people that have carefully trained these systems and fed it with data, that was a uh, like it's like it was some kind of secret, but it's just. Uh, I mean, these systems need a lot of human annotation where I guess you guys are coming in as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I, I think these, the articles that I've read seem to be focusing on the ethics of this. Um, but I, 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 I'm talking about our competitors here, not, not us, but, uh, I'm, I, I don't see that they've actually, um, I don't see any genuinely unethical behavior going on. I actually see it as being um, all, all pretty positive. Talking about competitors, what are your thoughts on these kind of fast growing or well-funded new cohort of competitors like Scale AI, Search AQ, or Snorkel is uh, one of the most recent ones that came on my radar. Like, are they changing the landscape? Are they catching up? Are they doing something very different? I'm always guessing a little bit with with what exactly competitors are doing. And, um, I, my, my experience has been that, um, that there is a, often a gap, a substantial gap between the marketing and the reality. Um, but I think that scale, scale has done a lot of positive things. I mean, they, they attracted a lot of attention and clearly people are investing in them. Um, uh, but Appen also uh, attracted a lot of attention and took a lot of investment on the, um, on the basis that they were strong on technology and then turned out that in reality, um, they were still really a services company and, uh, the share price dropped from $45 to $2.50, um, not in one hit, but you know, that's a, that's a long way down. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether I, I, my impression is that scale is, is quite strong on technology, very strong on technology and that they're doing technology partnerships with, uh, with large corporations, at least that's the, the word on the street. Um, and that's, that's a pretty exciting thing. Um, but I think that, I think. My understanding also is that perhaps there's still more of a services background in there than the publicity would lead you to believe. I also wanted to bring this up. It's a little hard on a podcast if we don't have visuals, but I recently read a, a piece by Sridhar Ramaswamy, an early Googler, a partner at VC firm Greylock, and now co-founder of a search firm called Neva. And he basically broke down the current AI e ecosystem into like five broad buckets. Um, Foundation model players like OpenAI, AI front-end startups like Jasper, Copilot, like uh, LLMs like Lilt. Uh, he, they mentioned Lilt, that translation tool. Uh, AI agency, in our view. Uh, tooling companies like ScaleAI um, and LXT, and big compute clouds like Google, Azure, AWS. And so let me just uh, read a quote. So he said that, uh, data labeling companies, they, they were included under tooling companies and said they were classic shovel providers in a gold rush. Uh, so what are your thoughts about this framework and kind of the description of tooling companies as the shovel providers? I'm not at all offended by it. Uh, when my friends have asked me what I do and I explain to them and they still don't get it, I, I've actually used the same metaphor to describe it. Um, so no, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not offended by it. Uh, I. I think it's actually quite a, quite a reasonable uh, position and, and like a, like a gold rush, you know, I joined Apple in 2001, we had, we were small and we were small, but we were still one of the biggest. Um, we had three or four competitors around the globe. Even by the time that I retired from Apple in 2018, we you know, the, the landscape had expanded, but we probably didn't have more than 20 competitors. Um, but I read a report last year that said there's probably 150 players in this space now. So, 
Um, much like Gold Rush, uh, there's a lot of people coming and setting up shop close to the mines. There you go. Uh, and as it happens, the mine's still in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just like the original Gold Rush. Yeah. So how do you approach maybe the buy versus build uh, equation as, as a company? Has, has LXT done any M&A or is that on your uh, kind of growth strategy going forward or not at all? It's absolutely um, there in our growth strategy and we've had some, some great conversations, but uh, I don't know if you've been through this yourself. Um, I've been through a few. Um, you have to um you have to have a lot of conversations with a lot of people before you actually find something where you can get it across the line so um m a requires you know a huge amount of legwork um going and looking at things even if you suspect that they're not not a genuine opportunity um i, I yeah, let me take a step back um yeah during i i've looked at successful M and A from a number of perspectives. I mean, it can be that it can simply be that they do the same thing as you, but they have a bunch of customers you don't, and that, that will improve things. Um, they could just be bringing in a, a monstrous amount of, uh, revenue. So that happened. We did a acquisition of a company called Butler Hill. Um, it was a good deal. They, they had a lot of revenue, but really only had one customer. So they had um, a saturation problem. We brought them in and it improved our saturation problem, which wasn't as bad as theirs, but by bringing the two together, things got better. The valuation of the, the valuation of two together was much, much higher than either of us as individuals. And, um, so you can work on that basis, but. We've also done it for buying technology and LXT, as I said early on, um, we're a services company today, but a services company with ambitions to compete with the likes of Scale AI, um, by being very tech forward. Um, we, in terms of your initial question, build a buy, we have internal teams working on build right now, but, um. Yeah, you know, we're a small organization. Uh, the bulk of our um, effort and our payroll goes towards delivering for clients. Um, so we're definitely on the lookout for opportunities where we can buy somebody that's got emerging technology, uh, potentially somebody where their technology would benefit from our huge resources in terms of data. Um, if you've got somebody that's got great technology and no money, they probably can't actually take it to the next stage because they can't get their hands on the data. I mean, maybe they even have the money. They just don't have the clients and the actual like volumes, right? That, that you have. So uh, great tech, great money is one part, but then, uh, as we see in the translation industry, sometimes you actually need to get your hands on the volumes and the clients, which takes a decade or more to, you know, curate and build up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just two, two questions on data generally, like some. Um, what are some of the legal and kind of ethical considerations when collecting data that, that you're facing? Just, uh, some of the key points there. We don't run into a lot of, um, ethical issues in terms of our data collection. We're pretty careful about how we do it. Um, you do have to make sure that you've got permission from people, but, uh, we're pretty, pretty strict on how we handle that. One of the things that we, but yeah, you know, we do data collection, but we also do a lot of data annotation. A lot of that data annotation is live data where it's our, our clients, it's their clients, their end users that are providing the data. And, uh, I think if you go back five years, um, big tech was pretty laissez faire about how they handled that. They'd send it to companies like us and have it, um, annotated, uh, through crowdsourcing methodologies because crowdsourcing was a massive cost reduction methodology. What we're seeing today though, is that, um, the big tech are becoming, or have been forced to become much more willing to spend money on having the work done in secure facilities. So that's been one of the real growth areas for us. You know, we have a hundred thousand sized crowd on our books at the moment, 
but we've seen a real shift towards the need to have people annotate uh, inside secure facilities. And we went from having zero secure facilities a year and a half ago to now having five. Um, we've got uh, one in Cairo, one in Montreal, and three in the Toronto area. Wow, that's a, a bit of a moat that you're building around uh, as well. So it's not not as easy for these 150 additional competitors to just replicate this overnight. You have to have a lot of confidence to go out and spend the money on building the infrastructure, and your clients have to have a lot of confidence to guarantee you enough work to make it worthwhile. Also on data, like what we're seeing sometimes in the translation industry, machine translation, that there's like experiments uh, going on with synthetic data. So like the machine generates the data that's then used to train the machine. Is, is that something that you're seeing? And like almost like metadata is a different, I know it's used in a different context, but like, is that something you're seeing and building that metadata that's then used to train? At least in my observation, it that that is very, very strong, uh, in the image and video space. Uh, another reason that we we're opportunistically moving into that space, but we're not driving hard towards it. Um, so we feel that, you know, we don't have that synthetic data capability. Um, we probably need to develop it. Um, we're, we're looking at that now. So it's, it's definitely meaningful, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing it, um, at largest scale in imaging video. Let's close on maybe not predictions, but uh, a little bit of crystal ball still. Like, what do you see in the next two to three years? Where's this all going? Uh, are we at the cusp of like a major, major boom in AI? Or are we at the, maybe the peak of current hype? Where, where would you position uh, the industry at the moment? No, I don't, I don't think it's peak by any means. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's real early days. Um, I think. When I look at the, the data business, you know, the, the shovel business, if you like, um, I don't see that going away. Um, in fact, I'll, um, one of my clients a couple of years ago from a very big tech company, uh, was asking me to make a significant infrastructure investment. And, um, and I said, look, you know, we if we're going to do this, um, we, we need to have some comfort that there's going to be a need for data to come. And he said, look, Phil, how can I put this? When you and I are dead, we're still going to need more data than we've got. We assume that's going to be very far in the future. Yeah, I, I, I do hope so. Um, so, and in terms of AI itself, um, yeah, I think that it, it is. Yeah, for, for the, for major tech companies, it's, um, it's still, it's still something that's quite yeah, hard to tame. Um, you know, so there's some pretty exciting breakthroughs, but it's like a, it's a real hot potato. You know, you're juggling this thing that's exciting. It's, there's a lot going on, but you can burn yourself with it. Um, exactly the, what you just described earlier with, uh, the Google, uh, example. So I think, um. I think there's a, there's quite a long way to go before this becomes something that is super stable, uh, low risk, um, and able to be deployed with absolute confidence. I could be wrong, but I know I've got a good history of being wrong. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I got a good history of being right as well. And I mean, this is, uh, you know, when you have this hot potato, that's typically where a lot of opportunities, if it was all stable, then, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, returns and, and potential success would be a lot uh, lower as well. Uh, right. Phil, that was, uh, fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing this with us and, uh, yeah, see you. Thanks Florian. It was great to have the opportunity to chat with you. Um, and I look forward to uh, meeting you in person one day. Absolutely. Thanks Phil. Thanks.